Are you ready? Yes. Why am I asking you? Hi, I'm Manatorn. And I'm Sydney. And welcome to our show, The Loincloth Loin Hour. Hour. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was pretty in sync. I liked that. That, that was... wasn't in sync at all! No, it was. It's fine. It's fine. We have to do it again. We... <laughs> uh, okay, you know what? It's fine. It'll just, that's just how it's going to be. That's how it's going to start. Um, so... What is the loincloth hour, you ask? Well, this is a podcast where we're going to be dissecting shows we enjoyed growing up, such as... Cartoon shows. Cartoon shows, yes, yes. We're not doing, like, live-action shows. These are mainly... No, that's gross. No, live-action shows. We only watch cartoons. We only watch cartoons, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Specifically Gargoyles, uh, we're going to be talking about the show, um, the impact it had on us growing up. How it affected us. Yeah. Uh, we're going to start out with Gargoyles, but as time goes on, we'll probably branch out into other stuff too. Um, I don't know, like probably in between story arcs, I guess. I don't, Gargoyles is a long show. It is. Um, we'll, we'll, see what, how we, we'll see what happens. We'll see how we feel going forward, but at least... For now, we're going to go over every episode of Gargoyles in order and talk about it. Uh, we're going to recap the show, talk about what J subtext we feel is there, what J subtext is just in our heads. Uh, we're going to talk about all of it, and you get to listen to it. Isn't that exciting? Oh, it's, it's um, riveting. It's riveting. I can't wait to listen <laughs> to these two weirdos ramble about a 90s show. But, I can't wait to get started. I'm sure our audience is also very much looking forward to listening to us. Oh, we've already we've already reeled in millions. I can hear them right now, chanting. So, chanting. talking of weirdos, I guess we should introduce ourselves mm -hmm. and who we are. A. A. You want to go first? Uh, sure. So I am Manicorn, aka Soup Goblin, aka Croup. Um. I have had several blogs over the years, uh, mostly focusing on uh, homoerotic fan service in animation and comics, video games, like in media in general. Um, and that's just sort of like the niche that I have carved out for myself on the internet. Um, I'm a furry, uh, I'm a writer, uh, I'm sort of all over the place. Um, you may have seen my my fursona Inarag in like furry artwork over the years. And um I'm also a, a lifelong gargoyle fan. It it came on when I was right within the the target age range for the show. So I was there like from the ground floor. I was probably like eight or nine when the show started. And I was I was right in it. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to revisiting the show now and seeing how it holds up and how all those scenes of Goliath in bondage probably led to me being the kinky person I am today. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, hi, I'm Sydney, a.k.a. Sid. I am a writer, particularly just an avid fan fiction writer on the internet, but I'm working to get a degree on the side. I'm an editor, and I'm pretty much the primary producer for this podcast, as well as a few other podcasts that are existing out there in the world. Um, I've been editing and writing for pretty much my whole life, as long as I could remember. Um, I endeavor in a lot of creative projects on the internet from all sorts of uh, corners, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, primarily my focus has been on, you know, the furry fandom, as well as, you know, you know, action show subcultures and whatnot. Um, pretty much, uh, I've been a loincloth enthusiast for the better part of a decade or so now. Um, I, unlike, uh, unlike our friend Croup here, I was, uh, a bit of a late bloomer, and I didn't get into Gargoyles until I was, like, a younger teen. By that time, the show had already, like, come and gone. Though well, that's because you're just you're just a younger person. I am a younger so. <laughs> person. That is true. That is true. But um, like, I'm I'm in my mid thirties. You're in what? Like your mid twenties? I'm in early my mid twenties. Yes. Yes. So. Um. But through that, uh, in my younger teens, I was familiar with Gargoyles. I had some memories of the show from back in the day. I saw it was airing on late nights, and I really wanted to get around to watching it. 
and um recording uh the late night airings and watching it through my dvr from like the age of like 13 to 14 and so forth and i remember um always having the recordings in my dvr always revisiting them and um it, for me it's a show that really encapsulated some of my more coming of age years for me personally um i used to be a bit of a shy boy back in the day you know super insecure and stuff still trying to find my place in the world and you know, this is a show about a species of pretty much hot gargoyle guys who, you know, have their own hard time finding acceptance in humanity, and despite all the hardship of being understood, they uphold their morals. And it's, you know, just had an impact on me that, you know, has yet to leave me. It's just a very important show for me personally. And it's a huge part of why we decided to do this podcast together, because it's an important show for us personally. I think a majority of our of Krupp and I's friendship was founded on our mutual love for gargoyles. Yeah, I think that's how we first met, actually. Then we both have like, well, we have we both had animation yeah. GIF blogs where we blog about gargoyles, and I think that's how we first met each other. Yeah, we. And were... I think you also did touch on an important point that yeah, like the gargoyles, the themes in the show are very universal, mm -hmm. especially to a queer audience. Absolutely. And I think we both tapped into that too growing up. Absolutely. When we first found the show, definitely. Yeah. Um, Krupp and I, we were mutuals for a long time before we had officially started talking. You know, we'd often share posts and GIFs about, you know, just Hawkeyes and various, like, animated media. On We were on social media websites like Tumblr and Twitter. And through that, mostly, you know, just our Gargoyles posts and stuff, we've hit it off and we've been, like, best friends for, I think, how long has it been? Like, three, four years? half a decade it's, it's been a while it's, now. it's been a long time <laughs> yeah yeah it has and um i mean like I, we call each other bro and like I'd, I'd honestly view you as a younger brother to yeah me. like i think i talked to you more than my actual younger brother <laughs> yeah so. and i definitely i've never had an older brother myself per se but you are definitely the closest i've had to that um but yeah no <laughs> Yeah, no. Sentimentals aside, you know, it's with um gargoyles. Everyone in the furry fandom has their uh sort of gateway to getting into it. You know, it's like you see some sort of anthropomorphic character in media, or maybe an animal-like character with human qualities, mm -hmm. and you're just like, okay, yes, no, I would like to write fan fictions and yeah. get art commissions of characters such as these. And for me, that was gargoyles. That's um, why I I'm feel here. like gargoyles was that gateway for a lot of. I feel like gargoyles and SWAT cats. Oh, absolutely. Or, like, that gateway for a large number of, of people. Those are the two big ones right there, I think. As well as numerous other shows. But, like, those, I feel like those were really big ones. There was a tweet I saw not too long ago that said, you're either a Gargoyles fur or a SWAT cat's fur. And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. I feel, For me, I feel like, actually, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was probably oh. my gateway. Yeah, I know. Like, the original 80s show. Oh, I re I, I remember getting that's I'm an old man. I, I remember getting that show on like VHS back in the day. Um, because yeah, I did. I have an avid collection of like Power Rangers and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles VHSs when I was a young lad. Yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess we should go over like what Gargoyles actually is, or at least a little background info on it. So, um, in case anyone who's listening has not watched Gargoyles already, which I'm assuming most people already have, right? because uh, it debuted in 1994. But just in case this is your first time hearing about this crazy show, um, Gargoyles is a cartoon series directed by Greg Weissman, who has gone on to direct numerous other animated shows, um, with the main characters, as you can probably guess, are Gargoyles. Um, they turn to stone during the day, and they come alive again at night, and this is sort of going to be their story. And I guess from here, we can just start recapping the first episode, right? Yeah. Unless we have anything more to say. Yeah, I think we're at a we're at a healthy point um, where we can begin that. Yeah, because, I mean, one thing I would like to say, though, is, like, gargoyles in, you know, culture and, I think, lore, they're supposed to be, like, uh, protectors or avid watchers of, like, uh, castles and stuff, and... What the... Right, like real life gargoyles mm -hmm. are, are, you know, they're supposed to be protecting whatever their, uh, mm -hmm. whatever uh, edifice they're put over. 
That is the first time I have ever heard that word in my life. Edifice. 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 It's not the best word I could have chosen, but it's where my mind ended up. I'm glad I learned something. Like if you there. see like gargoyles, like you know, like on a church rooftop or something like that, it's like they're meant to be protecting the church. Yes, it's like yeah. a, well, it's a superstition of, sort it's of. It's kind of like a holy domain kind of thing or something like mm -hmm. that. But um, yeah, no, this show builds off of that concept, and uh, we are here to recap the first episode for our first episode of this podcast. Um, this first episode is titled Awakening Part 1 of five. Yes. There are five parts to the introduction. I think they made it like a whole feature-length movie. When it yeah, so out. like, the first episode of any cartoon always has a lot of work to do. It has to introduce every, like, main mm -hmm. character. It has to set up, like, the primary conflict. Um, it has to set the scene for, like, the rest of the show. And Gargoyles has so much going on in it. Mm -hmm. That they they chose to do this over five parts. Like basically, they have a an opening movie, yeah, not much. an opening episode, um, which I think they definitely use their advantage because they set up a lot, um, not just in this first episode, but like the whole five parter. Uh, like oh God, yeah. uh, fucking, like my notes are many pages long just watching this first episode. <laughs> like they do a lot in it. Yeah, no, I went through a lot of paragraphs myself. Um, I can say from my experience, like, getting to, you know, revisit the show, uh, you know, it's like when I first turned on this episode, getting ready for the for the podcast, I'm, I was actually, like, super both excited and nervous. I'm like, oh my god, because it's like, it's been so, like, I, I talk it about Gargoyles a lot, but, like, it's been so long since I actually sat down and rewatched the show. So when I first turned on the episode and I saw the title card and the musical cues hit, and then we see, like, the overarching shots of the city landscape um i'm just like mm -hmm. i was just i was so giddy this entire episode like dude. it's sort of like a rush of nostalgia no, too. like i could not stop smiling the entire episode like i was just so happy yeah it's just a very it. enjoyable show to watch oh, God. but yeah so the first thing we see is just awakening um on the screen in like this uh this sort of gothic looking font and we hear a very deep growling sort of animal noise which mm -hmm. I, I assume is a gargoyle noise like a gargoyle growl yeah um, before yeah. it fades out and then the very first thing we see after that is an actual gargoyle not like one of the characters of the show but just a normal gargoyle um on top of a building yes and then we we pan over and we see the new york city cityscape i'm I know I'm supposed to recognize the one building that we see there. There's like the, that yellow tinted building, but I honestly, I've lived outside New York City most of my life. I don't know what any of the buildings are, like <laughs> the famous ones. Um, so if you know what that building is, <laughs> I mean, please I, mail I, us and let me know, because I did not bother looking it up before we started recording this. You know, you want to know something awful? I also didn't bother looking it up. I looked up some things, um, we but did. we'll get to that. But anyway, so we, we pan over the, the New York City cityscape, and then we see on top of one skyscraper, we just we start hearing action music, mm -hmm. and then we just see explosions happening on top of it. There were, like, clouds. Uh, we don't know why yet. There were explosions, and we have um, pretty much these giant, like, boulders of rubble just, like, raining down from the top of the tower mm -hmm. into the city streets. And one thing yeah, I noticed... people down below are just sort of screaming and running and panicking. One thing I noticed, like, notice? something was going on in the building where it's, like, there was, like, storms and, like, explosions and stuff to where, like, people weren't, like, running away. They were, like, actively, like, surrounding the building wondering what the fuck was going on. Yeah, okay, that continues for this entire scene. <laughs> like, Rubble falls several times, and every time it happens, there's still people right underneath it like <laughs> and the police have been telling them we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves here but the police have been saying like back away back <laughs> away it's dangerous and every time this happens it's like four or five times there are still people who almost get killed i'm like i know it's new york city guys but like get away from the fucking building where rocks are falling like guys yeah come on <laughs> I don't know. It was it was pre nine eleven. There wasn't such a such a need to like portray New Yorkers as these kind of like um uh, like run away from like any like loud noise kind of people because it's that's exactly how they are from what I understand. Um, but no. Well, yeah. Now to give us a sense of self preservation. Exactly. Yeah. But I guess yeah. Back in the early nineties, that we more had the. Uh... 
the uh the reputation of just you know not giving a fuck and just be like i don't want to just cross the busy street i don't right. care i don't care if a car is coming i'm walking here it's that sort <laughs> I'm of thing. walking here but, uh-huh um, actually this opening scene always kind of reminded me of ghost, the end of ghost ghostbusters i was just about where... to say <laughs> Oh my god! Because just like doesn't that happen in the movie? Like it does. rocks fall and that's like, like at the end of the movie, where like, where, like yeah, where, like they're opening like the gates of like hell or wherever, and like all the New Yorkers are just like surrounding the building. They end up like you know like having to avoid like all this like rubble or whatever. It's just like get the fuck out of the way. Yes. Anyways, so um, while all this is happening, like you know, there's um a police car that pulls up or it's like a red car with a police siren on it i believe yeah it's just like yes it's just elisa's like normal car because she doesn't drive like a normal police it's car it's the elisa mobile yeah it's the elisa mobile and her car is fantastic by the way it is um i love her car we haven't even mentioned who elisa is but i we're just talking about how great her car is so because that's the first thing we see so of her. this kind of this kind of you know um, straight up, no nonsense uh, New York City detective Elisa Maza pulls up in her Elisa mobile. Um, in the I midst love her. Of, she's great. Like, the only cop that matters. And, like, okay, the police also respond to this, like, immediately. Like, within, like, ten seconds of rocks falling, like, three police cars just pull screaming up to the building. Exactly. I, I, I guess this is, like, abbreviated for animation, I'm assuming. But, like, that very quick response time. No, yeah, so yeah absolutely. The lead out of the car, uh, she's all business. She, you know, I think her first line is like, Maza, 23rd, what's going on? That's exactly what it is, I believe. I know, because I wrote it down. I was pretending uh, I wasn't sure, but uh, I, I you, am sure. You I just sly took dog. Um, and then the other officer on the scene, who, by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but this is Officer Morgan, who uh, is also in, like, many episodes of the show but he's already in this opening scene too i did not notice that i completely... yes his name is his name is officer morgan morgan i'm not joking about that oh my god um... <laughs> i and like like every, every time you see like a police scene chances are if you if you look for him like he's probably there but this is just an example of like gargoyles as a show just having such a large supporting cast and just sort of seeding uh, their characters like very early on. That's that's brilliant. I didn't notice that actually. I I, com- I almost I pretty much completely forgot about that character even existing. Well, he I think like the first time he's actually of any importance is in the comic book series, which oh, takes which takes okay. place after the show. And I'm pretty sure you haven't read, it. so I, that's why I, I've only he probably didn't leave a strong impression on you. Yeah, but when I saw him, I was like, "It's Officer Morgan," and then. <laughs> I, I looked him up in the wiki, and it is him. This is his first appearance. Oh, that... So that's very exciting. Anyway, he says something like, he says, like, like, got me, detective. Must be a heck of a party up there, though. Which, I don't know, I just thought was funny. Yeah, that is that is funny. What a, what a swell guy. Yeah, he's a character. He is. Um, more rocks fall. More people run screaming. Like, this has been continuing to happen uh, for a very Anyways. long time. I think at some point, like, the... Uh, like the water main gets broken or the the fire hydrant i mean like water starts spraying on the street and lisa just keeps shouting like get back or you'll end up street pizza oh i remember and then that. during all of this she notices that one of the pieces of debris has what looks like claw marks in it yes and she says the iconic line but what could be strong enough to leave claw marks in solid stone this is only iconic because I know they're going to repeat this line like three or four times. They do, yeah. In this five-parter, because they're going to keep going back to it, be like previously on Gargoyle. So honestly, um, when she, a- whenever she asks that line, or whenever I re- rewatch and I hear her <laughs> ask that line, I always think in my head, like, okay, well, there's several things, I'm sure. But then I realize I'm, I don't know enough about like solid material to dispute that something can I don't be- think... I don't think any animal could do like maybe a dinosaur could in like prehistoric times. I don't know if any present day Wolver- animals Wolverine. could leave claw marks. And oh my, yeah, the mutant Wolverine. Yeah, he probably could, but I don't think he's in this universe. Mm. Although he should be. 
it's probably there's there's gonna be a crossover i feel like at some point i don't know you know there was a marvel gargoyles comic but i don't think it was in the main marvel continuity like it was in its own continuity no uh, gargoyles takes place in the marvel universe we all know this no it doesn't you're making <laughs> stuff up listen i wish it did oh god then, i i I, just, I honestly hope god, it, i that wish it did great. Not that I have anything against Marvel. Well, then it should be, like, in the MCU. I don't want that. Wouldn't that be exciting? No, I leave my gargoyles <laughs> alone. I don't want to see, like, fucking... Like, I said it all excited, and I thought about it a little bit, and then I was like, I don't want that either, actually. <laughs> I just want... I just I'll tell want... you, you know, the only thing I do want of gargoyles is just to be in the next Kingdom Hearts game. That's all I yes. wanted for years and years. I was playing Kingdom Hearts Were you? Night. Which one? Oh, the first one. And... I was thinking to myself, you know, nice. they need like a gargoyles like crossover in one of these games. Although I think they're done making. Kingdom I've been Hearts. saying this for years. Any anyway, we have gone on a tan. We're not supposed to be talking about Kingdom Hearts. We we have enough to talk about already. Just this first episode. Listen, it's a we can save tangents to life for like a board. That episode. that is true. Yes, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack. Okay, but anyway, so as soon as she says that line, there's a fade out. And then we finally see the title card of Gargoyles. Yes. Um, accompanied by like a crackling flame sound it's effect. It's almost and like then... the title card is answering her question. Yes. It's like, you want to know? Well, just keep watching, kids. So also, we're just going to tell you it's Gargoyles. That's yeah. the answer. Yeah. Uh, but So we open onto a time skip. Suddenly, it's Scotland, uh, 994 AD. And there is a pitched battle between uh, Scottish archers on, you know, or, uh, guarding a castle against a Viking army who's attacking them. Uh, no explanations given for any of this, but I mean, I think we as viewers can just figure it out. Yeah, it's medieval times. There were armies back then. There were battles. There were. <laughs> um. So there's like a lot of fighting going on. And there's the Vikings who are trying to storm the Scottish ca castle. And the Scots who are trying to defend it, and um, right, and it doesn't seem like things are going very well because the Vikings have catapults, mm -hmm. and like we keep seeing Scottish people just basically just die underneath large we rocks do. that come and kill them. Like it's very, it's very brutal, I would say. Um, uh, we do get our first glimpse of the gargoyles here, who are just statues at this point, but we see the top of the tower very briefly, where we see at least Goliath in his thinker pose up there. Yeah, like the iconic uh, thinker, the thinkative thinker. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like, there's another thing to embellish on the fact that it wasn't going well for the Scots was, like, literally that scene where, like, the two Scottish soldiers were, like, to the um, the captain guard. Who, I was just gonna mention that. Yes. yes, go on. Um, they were like, they were like, yeah, we need to get, we need to get out of here. This is crazy. They got catapults and shit. That's not exactly what they say, but that's like my. Well, okay, I I do know what he said. Okay. So, okay, so <laughs> this the first hot dad of the show pretty much comes in here. It took the show all of two minutes to get their first hot daddy. Um, he will not be the last by any means, but he's the captain of the guard. Um. How would you describe that? He has a mustache. He has like mutton chops. He has very a like middle aged manly dog. He has a mustache say. that's gray and hair and mutton he chops. He is a that's great brown. mustache. Yes. And, and he's just he's yelling at the soldier, like, stand fast. We can hold them back. And one of the soldiers who's there is just like really bratty. He's like, I and catch boulders with our teeth while they're about it. And. <laughs> He sort of turns around and he says, "Like it's your choice, then, me lads. The catapult or me," mm. which I took to mean like he—that's like a spanker line to me. That is like he draws his sword as he says it, but the implication of me is that he's just just trying to put this dude like over his knee, right in the middle of the battle. I mean, maybe I'm biased for some reason to that reading no absolutely but, <laughs> i i feel like he's canonically spanked at least a quarter of i i feel there. like that's extremely canon right now yeah um yes and he, he also says um well actually okay so first um the two soldiers he's talking to like literally just run away 
And I don't know if they're leaving their post or if they're running to the battle. Like, I, I have no were, idea. They were running to the battle, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But the Vikings are, like, outside the wall. So where are they running to? It's know. not important. Okay, listen, listen. Um, <laughs> it's not important. <laughs> it's not important. They're... But he also says, well, in a few minutes, the sun will be down, and then we'll see some fun. Which, for a split second, like, you see another group of soldiers close by, and they looked vaguely surly about, like, hearing that. <laughs> did you notice that? Like, it was only oh, on them man. for a second. I did not. Your brain is picking up things that... Yeah, like, they just sort of, like... Well, because I, I watched the episode twice, taking these notes. So, like, did. It's just I, something I, I, I never watched it twice. Doing, I've never noticed before. But, like, you know, like, yeah, it seemed like already they're sort of laying the groundwork for that there's a human prejudice against the gargoyles. And they're sort of annoyed at the captain of the guard for, like, having a strategy that utilizes the gargoyles in it. Mm. Um, but it doesn't really matter, because, like, half a second later, all those humans who look pissed off immediately die because the catapult just comes and, like, kills all of them. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm. um, right after that, we get probably uh, the start of your boner, Sid. Yes, a certain okay, character gets so introduced. we are introduced <laughs> to um, the Viking clan leader, Hakon, who is this, um, I'm thinking like maybe mid to late 30s Viking individual. Um, I'm thinking so. Muscular, blonde, muscular, bearded. Muscular, blonde, no, bearded, a Viking. voiced by Clancy Brown, the man himself, uh -huh. who... Like, okay, whenever, like, there are several scenes in that episode where they focused a lot on his, like, breathing or, like, his growling and, like, his yelling. I did notice. I mean, there's a lot of growling yeah, there is. Stuff there in is. this first episode, but yeah, like, he's definitely one of the them. The dynamic, the growling dynamic between Clancy Brown's voice and eventually Keith David's voice was oh my set God. Can you imagine them just, like, both growling just together? I like, could. in unison? I, I have thought about it a lot. Like, first it's at each other, but then, like, they harmonize their crowd. <laughs> <laughs> what am I talking about? Dude, I'm, I'm <laughs> all about this. I'm gonna write this down in my notes for fanfiction purposes. Oh my god. In this, in the Viking army, sort of the same thing is happening. Like, there's these two guys who are just sort of muttering about, like, how attacking a castle full of gargoyles is a really fucking stupid thing to do. But like the Scottish soldiers, they're doing this, like, when their commanding officer is literally, like, right next to them. Jesus. And, and he just, like, grabs one of them and is like, no, my friend, that's not crazy, referring to, like, how attacking the castle is crazy. He says, questioning my sanity when I'm in earshot, that's crazy. And he just sort of, like, pushes him away. Oh, God. It's just, there's so much I want to talk about, but we're not... We're not there yet, but yeah. So if anyone listening, okay, so if anyone listening isn't already aware, um, Sid's biggest crush on this show is a character named Wolf, oh God. who was not introduced yet, <laughs> but he has the same voice actor as Hayton. So every he time Hayton speaks, um, Sid is just going to get flustered and blushing, just because like, it's his voice coming out of that mouth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Just like fan yourself like I've, a southern bell. Like, oh, I'm already doing that. Me. You don't even know. You can't see it, but I'm doing it. Then they um they begin scaling the tower, I believe. Yeah, they throw like these cool grappling hooks like up to the top, and then they just start climbing the walls. And the Scottish soldiers just completely suck ass because they're not stopping this from happening. No. Like they, I don't know how they won any battles without the gargoyles. So they're scaling um. They're scaling the tower. Uh, I think Hakon is like ahead of them for some reason because he's the yeah. Hakon first, and he goes straight for Goliath, which yeah. is another thing. Oh my god! That he has in common with Wolf. They both go right for the big guy. They do. There's a moment where um, there's a moment Hakon is like about to like approach the you know the Goliath statue, and he sees him, uh -huh. and he just kind of like freezes up when he sees it. He's and there's like kind of like the silence in, in like the atmosphere. It's just like, even at the statue, Goliath is very imposing. He is. He's just like, he's just like, am I really about to like, like, jump over this big, this big thing? Like, is this well, happening? Well, and also, he's not even convinced that gargoyles are real. No. Because he said earlier on that, like, he, he doubted that gargoyles, like, even exist. Which is another reason he's just like, shut, stop fucking talking about 
how it's dumb to attack a dust castle full of gargoyles. Like I mean, they're yeah. not even a thing. Which is weird. Like, I don't is that like is that a retcon that the show corrects later? Because I feel like gargoyles at this time period are like well known enough that I don't know. Like the do, do most people know about gargoyles at this time period? I don't think they did. I guess. I don't know. I thought that was a little funny, but like since it's the first episode, like we don't know enough yet to to know if that's weird or not. I I think it's weird. Okay. <laughs> so getting into the cool parts where um Okay, yes, the cool part. Like literally as Hakon is approaching the Goliath gargoyle, um the sun's like beginning to set, and then all of a sudden we get like the most like badass like sequence of just Goliath, like, breaking out from, like, you know, the stone, sh- like, I don't even know if, like, they grow the stone, or they just, like, become stone. I guess they become stone. So he, he just, like, breaks through the stone, and then he just, like, picks up yeah, he picks on, like, like the outer layer of stone. And he's just like, you are trespassing. Yes, in that growly teeth, oh David voice, and like he sort of look, looks at Hayton first, like, "What are you like? Watch this little twerp doing here, scaling my tower," and he's just like picks him up, and it's you get to see all of Goliath's big muscles. Have we mentioned he's muscular yet, dude? Um, there are several <laughs> action sequences throughout the show where, for a moment, I thought the only thing moving on screen were his packs. Cause just his back, just they moving. are like these giant fucking balloons, especially in the right well, angle. Like, he also does have a habit of like flexing mid fe- mid battle for like no discernible reason, he does. but like just because he wants to. Goliath, if he were like in in the real world as just like a guy, I feel like he'd just be a gym bro because he just likes to like show off his games all he's, the time. He's just like you can't you can't flex on him. He's that's no he flexes on you he flexes and rain stone chips down on you while he does that before that happens though Hachon actually swings his sword at Goliath like Goliath oh, is holding him with oh, one yes, hand yes, 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 yes. and then Hachon swings his sword and Goliath catches it with his free hand and there's a close up of his hand and then you see like some blood actually run down his palm oh my god that was it was so which is funny. very unusual for a kid show which I, I know that I as an 8 year old heavily enjoyed that I was like oh my god there's blood on one of my cartoons this is the coolest like i was super into that it's such a raw scene i was a bloodthirsty kid i think no i mean everyone is i think we all (laughs) go through that phase but like he catches the sword it's like i actually for a while i actually forgot i'm like do gargoyles like bleed and i now it's like yeah seeing that episode i mean i think we only see it a handful of times in the show but Mm -hmm. like this is probably the biggest example Yes. Of yes. blood. And yeah, so after that, Goliath just sort of like lets go of Hayton, or like like he lets go of him in pain, and Hayton like grabs onto his grappling hook or onto like a rope that was just there, and he like swings over to another tower. I do not know how he does he that. He doesn't let like I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he, he gets his like hand hurt, but it's like he doesn't show it at all. He just kind of no, like toughens tough through guy. it. And there's this cool shot you'll see where it's like He's kind of got like his glowy eyes and coming to the foreground as he sets like the blade aside, like it's nothing. And then he's then he tosses Hake on. I'm sorry, it's like you got to focus on just such a cool scene like that for a few minutes because it's like it's a no, lot, it's I a completely lot, agree. It's a lot to take in. Um, so but yeah, but the sight of Goliath's blood actually spurs the other Vikings to keep attacking despite all the gargoyles waking up around them because now they've seen that if gargoyles can bleed, they can also die. So like the battle just just keeps going on despite the gargoyles serving as reinforcements now um like other gargoyles are waking up they're all very muscular like like we only see male gargoyles in this scene um they're all really buff they're all only wearing loincloths which i guess is standard gargoyle dress code i mean i guess they gotta wear something i don't know yes i mean do they though you know i could probably see (laughs) i could probably see a few of them just sporting it like commando I can see that for a lot of the gargoyles. Um, but so, okay, af- after this happens, actually, uh, this part always bugs me after, actually. So we see a bunch of gargoyles swooping around, attacking the Vikings below them, and one of them looked exactly like Brooklyn. 
I did you noticed notice that? that. I noticed like, that. I thought it that looks was just Brooklyn. like him. And then it's like I squinted a little. I'm but like, then we pan up, and we see the actual Brooklyn, like <laughs> sitting on top of the tower with Lexington and Broadway. Oh so my like, gosh. I guess maybe that was Brooklyn's dad, or like an older relative or something. I don't know. They just reused the character model, probably. Probably. But that always bugged me. It's, just, it's like there's two Brooklyns, but there isn't. Anyway, we're calling them Brooklyn and Lex and Broadway, of course. But right now, none of these characters have names. Mm -hmm. um, Except for Goliath. Because Gargoyle custom is that they don't have names for each other. Goliath is like the one exception. Because humans named Goliath. Yeah, but we're just we're calling them by the name that they'll acquire later on, just because it's that's it's very what they're confusing. associated as. Like, not to mention their names. We're not. It's, um, we're not going to call it like the red one and yeah, the red one, the <laughs> fat one, the yellow one. It's like no, which is we'll just use their names for now. <laughs> yeah. So there are several action sequences, um, in which we are introduced to all the characters. Uh I believe, um. Okay, I think like Lexington and Brooklyn do something, but I can't remember for the life of me what it okay. was in the battle. I'm going to go over line by line what happens here, because one please. part of this scene is very important to me. Personally. I think I know what it's talking about. I think I know what it's talking <laughs> you, you about. You probably know exactly what it is. So, okay, so Brooklyn is he's looking very excited as he's watching the battle from the top of this tower. Um, I guess they're, like, these are all younger gargoyles, mm -hmm. so like, I, I think this is probably their first battle. They're I'm like assuming. teenagers. Or whatever, not teenagers. Uh, yeah, so like, not, not teenagers. Brooklyn's sort of, well, like, I don't know. They are sort of teenage-ish in this. Like they're, 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 like, they're basically like sent back to the years old, but like in Gargoyle's years, it's like, that's like teenagers. Yeah, like, I assume they're like mature, but they're still young. Um, yeah. And Brooklyn is, he's looking like, when I, when I saw how he was looking around, it, it reminded me of my cat when <laughs> there's a bird outside the window and <laughs> they just great. like, like hyper focus on this and like just keep twitching their head to follow the bird around. Like that's Brooklyn right here. Oh my god. Um then he says something like like shall we let our brothers and sisters have all the fun and, and he flies down to join the fight. And then Lexington, who is like the shorter, like nerdier gargoyle, mm -hmm. um asks the bitter gargoyle who's left, who is Broadway, he says, like, not afraid are you? Um which I thought was sort of, like, weirdly aggro for him. He's sort of aggressive in this whole first episode. Yeah. Um, like, I think I feel like he also wants to prove himself here. But uh, Broadway then, like, draws himself up. He's, like, the chubby... He's, like, the bigger chubby gargoyle. Um, but he draws himself up very cartoonishly. And, like, his stomach goes up into his chest. Like, he's sucking, And just forms, like, two, like, guy. really muscular pecs. And he says, afraid of me, why all of nature trembles at my passing. And then his chest, like, falls back down into his belly and, like, becomes how it used to be. Along with, like, this insane, like, belly flop sound effect that goes off. Oh and lets gosh. the team, like, pokes Broadway, like, by where his belly button is. And it's just, like, I don't even know what to think about this scene. There's like some animator was really into like, like fat kink and. <laughs> they were really into just the idea of like guys sucking in their gut, and they put that in exquisite detail in this scene. Like extremely detailed, and even as like a young kid, I thought it was oddly hot watching that, <laughs> and especially like Lexington like poaching him afterward, like sort of laughing. Like, yeah, okay, buddy. It's like, I don't know. Like, it just shows this, like, really cute familiarity between them that they can tease each other. Yeah. But, like, yeah. also, I was like, oh, my God, he's poking his belly. <laughs> 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 I mean, Broadway has a very pokeable belly. He has a pokeable everything. He but... does. <laughs> Everybody loves Broadway. He's He's just great. I love Broadway. We all love Broadway. Yeah. Um, but right after that, we then get our first glimpse of daddy number three mm. for this episode. Mm -hmm. There's so many daddies. There's a lot of oh dads. My God. There's a lot of dads. But we see the older gargoyle, Hudson. Uh, and he's just sort of like batting soldiers off the stairs. Like he leading has up to like the battlements. his scimitar or whatever he uses. Yeah, he has his sword out, but he doesn't actually stab anyone with it. 
He just kind of because like, he sways it. <laughs> yeah, like he's like he'll like knock aside their weapons and stuff or like block hits, but he doesn't actually cut anybody because it's a Disney show for children. Mm-hmm. Um, he does, however, just like knock people off of high places and they fall down and presumably die. Like that's okay, but <laughs> no on-screen stabbings. Right, right. So as that's happening, um, a soldier is creeping up from behind Broadway to, mm-hmm. like, club... Or, I'm sorry, but behind Hudson to club him, and then Goliath, like, swoops in and saves him. And all my notes say in this part is Goliath saves him because they're boyfriends, and he's gonna sit on that dick later. Um, I don't know why I wrote that down. You know... But I think it's probably correct. You know, that is 100%. Correct. I believe that is the case. I believe um, that there was uh, yearning for some sort of in- carnal intimacy there between. I feel like I two. definitely feel like they've had that history and they, they continue to have that history throughout the entire show. And like, isn't like Hudson kind of like an ad- advisor, kind of like a mentor for Goliath in a way? Right. Like, yeah, like, Hudson was the original leader of the clan, but he's now stepped aside for Goliath to take control. You know, this young, hot piece of ass, Goliath. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. So yeah, so Hudson's just sort of staying on to, like, advise him, it seems like. And then, uh, after he saves him, uh, Goliath says, watch your back, old friend. And Hudson, and Hudson is- replies, watch your own. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're talking about each other's butts there. You can't convince me. Oh my that. god! <laughs> like, like, watch your back. I feel like I feel like Hudson just said that like with a wink, like watch your own hot stuff. Yeah, no, no, Hudson oh is just a flirty son of a bitch. You know he would. So, as this, there's like a lot of fighting happening. Like this goes on for quite a while actually. But we see the captain of the guard like also fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Goliath does a cool like spin move at one point and like hits two guys with his tail, which I thought was pretty neat. Yeah. Um, he then like very purposelessly just flexed his muscles for no reason. Ooh, uh, that's what flexing. Goliath does. There's a lot of flexing <laughs> in the middle of the fights. The action scenes <laughs> in Gargoyles, like usually it's like with other shows. Um, I find like action sequences where just like there's a lot of you know like guitar riffs and things happening and stuff. They usually mm-hmm. don't entice me, but with gargoyles, like there's all these orchestral cues, and you know there's a lot of muscle flexing, there's a lot of growling, just stomp. Um, yeah, I mean they they keep my interest usually. It's not much to like talk about in the context of a podcast, but like no. yeah, they're always pretty exciting. They're fun. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and then I believe uh we eventually. In, in the midst of all this fighting, when we're uh, introduced to our main characters, uh, we cut back to Hakon, who, I don't know where the fuck he is, he's just, like, on some other part of, like, the castle, like, gallows, or whatever you call him, and, uh, then, then he encounters, um, one of the, uh, main antagonists of the series, or what would, right. what would eventually... So, first, he's fighting off their Gar Beast. Which is right. just like a gargoyle dog on it. It's it's Bronx. Yes. Bronx. <laughs> um, they have their big dog, and he's like, I think Bronx is like just trying to bite Hayton, but Hayton like, uh, either run- I think he just runs away from Bronx. Which Bronx is a big scary dog. Yeah. But yeah. then yes, he he's gonna run to the castle, but he is uh intercepted by our our prima donna. Who comes out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the lady herself um our our queen our queen our uh, <laughs> our holy queen of darkness um so yes demona comes out uh looking extremely evil and extremely hot like this is the first no, time absolutely. we're seeing her uh, she has glowing red eyes, which is different from the other gar- gargoyles we've seen, who've all had glowing white eyes. Mm-hmm. And we find out later, this is just like a male-female thing, like female gargoyles' eyes glow red instead of white. But at the moment, it just feels like she's a fucking demon from hell, who <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just comes out and she says, face me, human, if you dare. In like an extremely husky, like hot, 
Marina Sirtis voice, mm-hmm. and I adore her. No, yeah, I adore everything that's happening great. right now. And then she shows what looks like like vampire fangs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so everything's extremely wonderful as soon as she shows up on screen. Of course, yeah, no, um, it's definitely. It paints her in that sort of picture where it's like, you, you know you do not want to fuck with this character. No, like, even the music changes, like, to, yeah. like, this very, like, foreboding sort of, like, oh, feel like, you've stepped in it now. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. she's going to literally murder you. So, um, eventually Hakon finds himself, after this encounter, um, he finds himself cornered by, like, Demona on one side, Bronx on the other side, and... Right, and then Goliath flies yeah. in too. So like, there's a three way entrapment going on. Yeah, no, there's there's a three way. And, and this is I I have, I have to mention this one part. So Goliath flies in and he says, "I see you've met our watchdog." And then Demona like hisses at Hakon and like swipes her fingers like through his hair, but in an evil way. Like, did you notice that she's like? <laughs> I I think I did. She's, it was very weird looking. I was like, what are you? I guess she would just want to like freak him out, but it was very odd. Like it was okay. That is, that is in hindsight. I, I I think I definitely remember seeing it, but all I was thinking at the time was like, wow, Hakon's hair is so it looks so soft and blonde and stuff. Yeah, it looks like he conditions it. God, you're doing a great job with this recap because it's like I don't think my notes are as concrete as yours. I I took so many. You notes. Took a lot of notes. Um, I'm just gonna so, let you. Handle yes. The so first, Goliath says, "I see you've met our watchdog," and then Demona does that weird thing that she does, and Goliath says, "And my second in command as well," which is just like funny. Okay, that um, is funny to me. I wanted to talk about that about how he <laughs> makes his girlfriend second in command, which I mean. I don't doubt that she's tough. Well, okay, she is. I think she's more competent to be leader than Goliath is. Like, she should be first in command, in my opinion. Probably. Um, but yes, it is sort of like uh, what are the ethics of this? Like, they are sleeping together at this point. Listen, and they're also I, working I think plan with together. I don't know. It's literally just free for all. Like, just do whatever. It's sort of, it's sort of nepotism. Yeah, yeah. Um,. It's also at this point that, like, I started to really notice that the lack of character names was probably difficult for the writers to, like, get a handle on. Because, like, they keep referring to each other by, like, their ranks or their relationships instead of, like, just by their names. Mm-hmm. Like, Demona's always, like, my second or my angel of the night or, like, this or that. And same with with Hudson, like, Goliath always calls him, like, old friend or old soldier or, like, you know, whatever. It's just they refer to each other by roles rather than names. Yeah. And I don't know. It's just, it feels a little awkward every time they do it. I mean, it's definitely a, a, a thing the writers would have had to dance around for a while, um, at least until they got their Yeah, name. well, for, like, what? For, like, two episodes, I two guess. Two episodes, yeah. Until they stopped doing it. <laughs> But yeah, so okay, so Goliath then sort of grabs Hayton with his big muscular arm, mm-hmm. and I think they, I don't remember if they have a conversation, but right afterward, Goliath just like chucks him off the fucking wall, and he's like, sure, get the fuck out of sure here. I'm sure Goliath is like, and stay out, and then he like kicks him out, like he's just kicking yes. him out of like a fucking restaurant or some shit, and he falls into and, like- And Hayton says something like, this isn't over, monster, I'll be back! Something Which like the that. Gargoyle is like, I feel like they should be concerned about, but they sort of like grin and laugh about it. They're like, whatever. <laughs> and then as as all the other Vikings are running away, the this is like the first time I just saw very blatantly recycled footage of just they just show like the same clip of the Vikings running over and over to show multiple people, but really they only animate like two guys. <laughs> it's okay. I know animation's expensive. It's With- just I noticed it like very. <laughs> The way I it was very it, obvious. The way I remembered it was definitely a lot cooler than how you just described it. <laughs> like, I just remember, like, oh, yeah, people were everywhere. They were trying to get away, and you're just like, yeah, it's just the same animation. Yeah, you. like, you see, like, 20 people, like, running. True. But, yes, like, yes. you know, it's they're all just copies of each other. <laughs> Gosh. All right, so so right after that, there there's just a celebration. Uh, all the humans are cheering. And then you see above them, all the all the gargoyles are like hanging out not on top of this one tower and the captain of the guards is with them and he says you know goliath we owe you our lives and goliath responds as we owe you ours every day which you know that's 
that's meant to be our understanding that it's a symbiotic relationship like mm-hmm. the gargoyles protect the humans but also the humans protect them mm-hmm. from vikings like this yes yes um, right after that the scene then switches to what looks like like a feast i guess that's happening within the castle mm-hmm. or they're still celebrating and then we see I'm going to say some very uncharitable things about a few of these characters, oh, but we see the it. princess go inside. It. Go for it. Um, along with her with her advisor, the Madis, mm-hmm. who... How do you even describe these people? Uh, I mean, they're like... they're like, How would you describe the Madis especially? Oh, man. Um, so, it's like, you know, you have, like, the pictures of, like, the people in, like, royalty and stuff. And they're kind of snobby looking, and uh-huh. like you see, like the the weird Weasley guy next to like the queen, and he's like whispering <laughs> into her ear or something. That's how I would describe. Oh, him. like like wasn't that like a Lord of the Ring character? Was that Wormton Dude, or something? I don't know. I'm not like a Lord of the Rings <laughs> fan. There's probably something um, there, but so okay. So the princess, she's she's to me, she's like a royal like spoiled. Brat Is she at this a point princess or a queen? I think she's a princess. Why the hell are they taking orders from her then? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're like, well, from my point of view, I think the royalty should be abolished and no, class struggle equalized. But yeah, I, at this point in time, as just a feudal society, I assume that they live in. I, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, okay, so the Magus. I'm going to try. All I wrote down for his description in my notes is he has insane sideburns, which he does. He does. He does. And he probably thinks twink discrimination is real. <laughs> and I feel like that's also very true. He's got like eyeliner and stuff too. I always confuse him with Puck. But okay, right? They, that's they because both they have like so the elfish. same hair, I think. Yeah, and like I always think that Mages should be an elf. Because like do. everything besides his lack of pointy ears seems to be to me to like to look elvish like he has a very pointed chin he has sort of like fey features Mm -hmm. but no he's just a he's just a normal dude so okay so as as these humans are celebrating um we see the captain of the guard sort of walking in and then as he's going by there's another conversation he overhears because every time soldiers talk shit in this episode their commanding officer immediately hears whatever it is but so so one guy says, I like the fine soldiers are captain of the guard, but in sort of like a sarcastic way. Like he's really saying that the captain like sucks ass. And then his his buddy replies, Captain of the Gargoyles, you mean? And they sort of laugh about it. Like Which to me is really fucked up because the gargoyles just literally saved all all of yeah. these people's lives. No, that's and they're like all immediately they're back on their bullshit of just be like, oh fucking gargoyles, we hate living with them. Oh man, like the whole thing, like, um, is really well done to where it's just like you have such distaste for all the humans in that room. Yeah, like you sort of understand Demona's point of view later on as like you do yeah, fuck humans. Like <laughs> she's very misanthropic, and it shows early on. Mm-hmm. So as as the captain goes up to the princess, she says, Our thanks for a battle well fought, good captain. And he replies that the real thanks is owed to Goliath, because, you know, he's the one who actually fucking routed the enemy army. Mm-hmm. And she responds, oh, Please don't mention that monster's name in my presence. God, she's I'm just so... like, bitch! <laughs> she's so... <laughs> they just saved your ass! Oh my god. No, I mean... It's like, I understand, like, the dynamic, but still, you just can't help but have, like, such distaste for these characters. Like, it pisses me off. Um, mm-hmm. Immediately after that, the doors open, and Goliath and Demona come in. No, like, the and guards, I don't know, like, like... I don't I know if you they... noticed this part, but the Magus immediately, like, drops his goblet that he's holding. I remember that! <laughs> like, he's that stared. He's like, oh! <laughs> And the guard, like, the guard the captain is literally just like, yeah, no, I, I took the liberty of inviting them for... Yeah, uh, he's like, guys, like, calm the hell down. <laughs> so, um, so... But yeah, so the princess replies, though, she says, we are most seriously displeased to allow beasts in the dining hall. It's, she says it with such, 
like attitude like scorn it, yeah it's like you, you and then, then the maid just backs her up though he says you speak wisely princess these are unnatural creatures no good can come from associating with them which is also fucked up because the dark girls are not unnatural at least in the context of this show no um they're as natural as humans are yeah, like the third race, they're probably unnatural, or you know, they're magical. But there's nothing magical about the dark oil. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's not even like all the gargoyles are in the dining hall. It's literally just like Goliath and his girlfriend. It's, it's two of them. Yeah, like the the leader of the gargoyles and his second. So I always thought that scene was kind of funny because it lasts like the, there's just like a brief exchange of words before like just Goliath and Demona bail. Um, yeah, they're like, fuck this noise, we're out of here. The like, I remember the guard captain is like trying to vouch for them, and Goliath is he actually like fucking bows to the queen or princess or whatever yeah, so, the fuck she is. Like uh, you know, Goliath he's comes showing, in after he's showing respect. It was he is showing respect. Yeah, so he comes in and like there is like very menacing music, however, like as he approaches and like. They can only do this in the very first episode, because we don't know Goliath yet as viewers, but, like, the viewer isn't quite sure, like, how this is going to go down. Like, because yeah. Goliath is acting sort of scary right now. Mm -hmm. And, like, he sort of, like, narrows his eyes, like, before he comes in the room. He does. But then, like, when he gets there, he flares out his wings, because uh, he's very extra. Like, he's, like a cat. And then he does, like, his wing cape thing, yes. which is one of the best things that the Dark Girls designers Oh ever my came god, up I can't phrase it looks that amazing. enough. Like, like, they just sort of drape their wings, like, over over their shoulders, and, like, they, they clasp, like, the ends of them together, so like, it looks like just this awesome, wonderful looking Whoever came up cape. with that has, like, just the biggest brain. Like, just the biggest IQ. Yeah, I would like to give them. I, I would like to buy them a drink. Oh, yeah. If I could. And so, like, right after that, um, the guard captain, yeah, he does vouch for them, like you said. He says, Goliath, we named you well, it seems. You are as good as the Philistine giant who fought David, which I assume he had to mention for all the kids who didn't go to Sunday school who are watching this. Mm. Um, and then the princess, uh, excuse me, the princess says, you would do well to remember, Captain, that the biblical Goliath was also a bully and a savage. Proving that she also went to Sunday school, just like uh, I yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, no, like, there's... <laughs> and Demona, like, fucking hisses at that. Like, she she is ready to she, slay she's here. She's, like, ride or die at this point in time. I love Demona, and, like, I'm completely like, on her side, because this is just, like, it's not deserved. No, no. It's not cool, I mean, especially after what they just did. You know, God love Goliath. He's trying to uphold his morals the best he can. He's just... He's trying, you know, he's... I feel like he and Demona, they're uh, at this point in time, their relationship is very similar to like Professor X and Magneto. Like Goliath <laughs> just wants uh, like peace between the humans and the gargoyles. While Demona is just like, no, fuck the humans. Gargoyles are better. Um, they've been shitty to us forever. Like reparations. Give us our fucking castle back. After they storm out of, like, the dining hall. They didn't storm out, they just kind of left. I think Demona... They, well, out. yeah, like, Goliath sort of, like, puts his hand on Demona's arm and is like, if you'll excuse us to, like, everybody, because he knows that Demona is about to murder someone. He's just like, you can murder someone out in the hallway where the humans won't see. Honestly. <laughs> yeah, and then, like, the princess kind of bitches the captain of the guard out, too, like, after the guard girls leave. She's like, from now on, you'll report... Directly to the Matus and not to me, because I don't want to even fucking see you. Jeez. Oh, just kind of fucked up. No, it is, it is. And that kind of, um, that does kind of foreshadow, uh, certain circumstances to come near the end of the episode. Yes, it foreshadows the end of the episode. Yes. Which, like, by the way, we're only, I think, about halfway through describing this episode. I think we're maybe halfway through, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because there's so much that fucking happens. There so, is, all right, so there out is. in the hall, um, the captain, like, apologizes on the princess's behalf, like, because she was such a bitch. Mm -hmm. And Goliath tells him it's no biggie. He says, We are what we are. Her opinion will not change that. Whatever that even means. Yeah, um, I don't and know. Demona. She says, have you no pride, no sense of justice? We save their lives and they repay us with contempt. But what makes this interesting is the captain is, like, totally on Demona's side. He says, no, she's right. 
and you deserve yeah, I better. Remember than that. That. Yeah, like which I thought was interesting. Like he he's definitely signing with the gargoyles over the humans here, because the humans are fucking racist. Um, Demona says that the humans were their home ages before the humans even came along. They should be bowing to us, which again, that shades of Magneto to me with his mutant supremacy stuff. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. There's there's and, definitely a lot of um there's a lot of similarities with like gargoyles and X-Men too, which is like, there definitely is. Um and then Goliath delivers what is probably like the uh like the big theme of the whole series, which is it's the nature of humankind to fear what they do not understand. Their ways are not our ways. Hmm. And then, like, as he said this, like, the view is, like, he's framed by candlelight, and he has, like, a very soft, growling voice, and you can kind of see, like, why Demona dates him so bad, despite him being sort of a himbo. Because she just kind of, like, sighs, but then, like, sort of, like, is like, okay, and then, like, they're holding hands, and they're like, oh, there are times when your patience astounds me, my love, and they're all being lovey-dovey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And... Very cute, but then the, then the view switches to the captain, and I don't even know like what his look is supposed to represent there. Like he looks vaguely like sad. I just think he wants to be in that three way. No, absolutely. But, like... He wants to um <laughs> he wants to have a three way with both Goliath and Demona. But there's a lot of like that's there. sort of how I interpret that yeah. look. I think it's supposed to be like well he knows what's what's coming, and he's having like doubts maybe, or he's just like pissed off that humans suck so much. So directly after that, the scene switches the gen, and now we're in like the Matus' lab. Which the first thing we see in this lab is this amazing skull candle. Mm. Um it's like he's the evil queen from Snow White. <laughs> she she had I a skull forgot candle. About too, the didn't skull she? Candle. <laughs> like whose <laughs> skull is that? What did you do? I, I yeah, like who's that's a very good question. Did he murder someone and take their skull? Why why can't I don't know where what's this, wrong well with no because the Archmagus candle had the candle holder. first. So I feel like the Archmagus definitely did just murder someone and make a candle from their skull. Absolutely. And he needs that for his <laughs> his, his weird magus laboratory for weird magus. Oh, well, it's the aesthetic. I it's guess. The, <laughs> Like it's supposed to signify that there's like some sort of magic going on or something. There's expectations when you're an evil sorcerer to like have a certain mood. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, like nothing happens in this scene other than the mage is just flipping through his spellbook, looking pensive. It'll be established. Like, I don't think it needs to be here other than to remind us that the mage exists. And it set us up for what happens directly that, after this. You know, it's like, we can only take so much of his existence. We don't need reminders. <laughs> yeah, like, I honestly don't. Um, so right after that, it's daylight. The gargoyles are, are back to stone. And we see a mysterious hooded figure leave the castle. So we can't tell who it is, but I'm assuming that we're meant to think it's the Magus. Yeah. Or we just saw him doing something, like, vaguely suspicious. Although, like, just looking through a book isn't very suspicious to me, but yeah, I guess as... Yeah, no, um, <laughs> it's, it's definitely set up to make us think it's the Magus, in that the hooded figure is tall and thin, mind you that. When... Well, they don't look very... Is he thin? No, like, when we see the hooded figure, it's, like, thin, but, like, later it's revealed other things, and you're like, oh, yeah. wow. I, I don't know. I, I kind of like... caught on to that, and I was just kind of like... Um, well, no, they wouldn't use that body stature, because not a lot of other people have that body stature that we've been introduced to so far. That's true. There's only a certain select number of people. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, this, this person on this horse, this figure. person on horseback, they go to the Viking camp, and he approaches Hakon, who's just there, like, eating meat mm -hmm. with his men and he's like you seek the fall of castle liver and like he says it in this really funny voice he does. i'm assuming whoever this is they're like impersonating the mages I know, like, right? for the benefit of the viewers watching oh not God. for any actual in character reason <laughs> it's so silly like it makes no sense and hayton is like what of it and then the the guy says perhaps the bargain can be made 
and like their sinister music. I almost forgot like the ton of voice they had until you like kind of mocked it right there. I'm like, oh my god, he's absolutely right. That was a silly voice. Perhaps a bargain can be made. Like, why is he doing that? He's being conspicuous. Like, is he? Uh, I just like maybe he's trying to hide his identity from the Vikings, but he isn't. Because later on, the Vikings know who he is, and they're working together. Like, oh the only God. reason he would be doing this is if he knows he's being filmed, <laughs> and that that film is being shown in 1994. He just, on the, figure the kids just WB, like, or whatever the hell channel this the was on. The figure kind of just, like, looks at the camera and then winks, like, in the middle of talking. <laughs> Oh, I, I did notice that we do sort of see inside his hood, and, like, we don't see who it is, it's all just, like, shadows, but we do see, like, a an impression of sideburn on the face. Mm -hmm. And there are two characters. Which is, but there's, there's, two, there's people two people who could be that. We're, 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 we're detecting it down as we speak who it is. Yes, I wonder. <laughs> You have the Magus and the Guard Captain, the only characters with sideburns in Scotland. By the way, neither of these characters have actual name. They don't. Like the mate is Matus his name? Or because it Matus is just another word for wizard, I think. I and then Captain of the Guard doesn't have a name either. Like I looked him up on the Gargoyles wiki, and he's he's literally just Captain of the Guard. Hmm. Which I thought that was weird. But well, I, I guess mean, it's fine. you know. There's, it's fine because you know the gargoyles didn't have names and they got names. The guard captain never got a name. Right. It's fine. So it's, maybe, it's maybe that's why the captain of the guard is such good friends with the gargoyles because he also doesn't have a name <laughs> and he identifies with them for that reason. Um, He's like, yes, I too am nameless. Beautiful. Um. That is beautiful. So the next, the next scene after that, we we go back to night. I think. Yes. And something I have to um just really express upon is the fact that Broadway didn't do anything this entire episode except eat in the background. He eats a lot though. He, like <laughs> he does a lot of eating. <laughs> like that that is his personality right now. He's just that funny fat character. And yeah, what's funnier I was gonna say it's, it's kind of a stereotype, I think, at this point. But I mean It's so funny. That's that I mean now it's like looking at it, I'm like, yeah, that's so Broadway. But like watching it for the first time, I'm just like, we know nothing about this character except that he likes to eat. Yeah, and like we the, we're well the for the at least for the trio, we're just doing like very broad stereotypes very to start very with. broad ways you could yeah, say very, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but before we get to broadway though there is one scene okay. where the captain of the guard and demona both try to urge goliath to take all of the gargoyles out of the castle and pursue the vikings to make sure they don't come back and goliath is Overly cautious, though, and he's like, no, that would leave the castle unprotected. Um, but he finally does agree to go, but only he'll only take Hudson with him. So, like, only two dark girls are leaving. Uh, Demona wants to go, too, but he tells her, no, you need to stay, because um, you're, like, the best warrior here. Um, he also has this extremely sexual line. Which I cannot do justice. No. Um, but yeah. which I, I urge you to please like get a clip of this and just put it into the show. I will do it. Or he this. says, very well, but I shall do it. I can scare those cowards away without any help. But I shall do it. I can scare those cowards away without any help. <laughs> That's too dangerous for you. And it's just extremely hot. I thought the <laughs> line you were gonna say was like when he's what talking, line? When he's talking to Demona and he's like, you oh, when he says you and I are one what? now and forever. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of hot there too. That's a good line too. Yeah, that was. I mean, There's a lot of hot yeah. Goliath lines. We'll get. See, okay, that tells you a lot about me though. Is that I found him just saying that he's gonna go and fuck people up way hotter <laughs> than him plunging his undying love and devotion to Demona. It was like, um, I remember seeing that scene and I was like, Oh yeah, no, that was a hot that was a hot line at first, but I thought about it, I'm like, oh wait, forever? That's not really 
That's a, ooh. Ooh. Uh-huh. ooh, that's foreshadowing. Yeah, I mean, right could, could that be considered foreshadowing? I don't know. You tell me. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like if Macbeth said it to Demona, that would really be foreshadowing. Oh, yeah. Did did she fuck Macbeth later in the series? I forget. She definitely fucks Macbeth. Doesn't she also fuck Thalog? Uh, she fucks a lot of people. She's, oh she's a she's a girl boss. I love and her. She is in charge of her own sexuality. She's so, she's so and powerful. And she fucks who she pleases. I want to be Demona when I grow up. All my me too. <laughs> um. So. <laughs> So yeah, so we go from that scene on the tower with like the the leaders talking down below, and we see Broadway eating the den, which we already went over how that's problematic. Mm. Um, I do have to note that Broadway eats an entire apple in two bites, and I mean like including the core of the apple, he just swallows the entire thing. Listen, where I there's something <laughs> I got to get into when we get to it, but <laughs> he does do something pretty pretty that i think extends the gross limits of eating an apple with the corn. okay yeah that, that'll be pretty soon we'll talk about that but i think i know what you mean yeah um but as as he's eating we see lexington and brooklyn just playing around with bronx um like they have a, a hunk of meat that they're just like tossing to each other and bronx is chasing it it's very cute oh no it's um, probably my favorite scene in the show it's adorable and demona like well, not the she show, like she the swoops episode. in and just sort of like perches above them and just sort of like watching them, and like she seems pleased that like they're playing around. Like she has a little smile on her face. Mm-hmm. She like a little um, mom smile. Yeah, exactly. And like the music shifted too. Like it was, it's just like a very pleasant scene. Mm-hmm. Which I, you know, it's nice to see that despite her other faults, um, she definitely does care for the gargoyles yeah, and like course. I mean, all, like everyone under yeah. her charge. Yeah. Uh, I mean that, that that's like great. a big part of it is like it's because she cares for the gargoyles. There's like a fu- there's a cause exactly. she feels she's fighting for. Um, and then um, we see this little human blonde boy pop up. Who we we had seen him very briefly earlier, mm-hmm. um, where he had been like watching broadway i think he no, probably he had such a sexual broadway. awakening just like we all did he, he watched broadway watching broadway <laughs> <laughs> um no but, like um, he, he saw broadway I, I we never talked about this earlier but broadway absolutely beat like one of the vikings with like a piece of meat or something like the bone yeah meat. like he was eating during the earlier battle and then like two guys like fighting like went by him and he just sort of reached over and like thunked one of the vikings on the head like with the meat and knocked them out and then thomas like this little kid watching was like oh that was so cool and like you know is you know he probably has his first crush which is adorable this this child is like approaching them and what does he ask them again um so he comes by, and the gargoyles all, like, notice him, like, watching them as they're playing around. And Demona notices it, too, and, like, she narrows her eyes. Like, she's ready to start shit mm-hmm. with this child. Yeah, no, up. like, she's ready to just but, fucking annihilate a child right here. Right, and, and, he, and he says, I'm Tom, what's your name? And then Lexington says, except for Goliath, we don't have names. And he says, how do you tell each other apart? He says we look different, which isn't an answer, no. Lexington. And um, then he and asks, then he asks, "But what do you call each other?" And Brooklyn says, "Friend," which again, like, fuck off. I'm like, I'm sorry. That's that's my favorite part of the episode. As as a human <laughs> watching this show, who speaks a human tongue. I just find it very difficult to like understand how how it works with their language just, and not having names. About... And maybe that just shows like how limited my own thinking is. But like know. when they're talking to someone about like someone else who's not present, how do they refer to that person? Like, yeah, they just call each other friend. But okay. so like if Goliath is like wants to talk about Brooklyn to somebody, he's like, Yes, my friend, uh, you know, the red one. He's sort of lengthy. He has horns. Like, what? Would it be easier just to have names for everybody? I don't know. I'm, I'm okay, sorry. So, so, <laughs> um, my take on that scene, um, that is my favorite scene in the episode because oh my god, 
It, it is okay. It's a very <sighs> sweet scene. It's like, um, it shows that there's no like. Well, I mean, I can't say that there's no judgment, but like, you know, that the gargoyles are so comfortable with each other that, you know, just automatically seeing one another um, and just registering that it's, you know, just a friend or someone they're familiar with. That, there's such, that is true. There's such a, like, there's such a sweetness to that scene. I can't really put my finger on at the yeah, moment. Yeah, like everyone in the clan has a real bond with each other. And I do really enjoy that. And I will say the whole name thing it does show extremely quickly to a viewer who hasn't watched the show before that gargoyle society is not human society and that like just because they talk like us um doesn't mean that like they view things the same way just like that's a very easy way of just showing like how how alien i guess their point of view can be sometimes like they don't understand the need for names unlike we who name fucking everything it, no, yeah, exactly. I think that's one of the more um the more admirable things about the gargoyles as a species is that um they uh I don't know. I just like I remember seeing that scene for like the first time in years last night and I was just thinking on like, you know, a world where it's like you could just be like or like just a sort of group where you're just familiar with one another where it's like you don't even have to like address each other by calling each other like Mm -hmm. uh title or something like that's just an individual you're familiar right. with yeah i mean i feel like in scotland at least every dark old clan is like a socialist commune and they just <laughs> everyone's a friend and they make sure everyone is taken care of yes it sounds like a nice place but anyway then tom's mom comes over and fucking ruins everything with racism Mm, I'm not. But I'm, she, I'm she not. comes up. She says, "Tom, keep away from those monsters." And Brooklyn is like, "We wouldn't hurt the lad, ma'am." And then she throws like a piece of wood at him. <laughs> Dude, I guess it's firewood. Like Dude. I don't. She was just holding she a piece of wood. Armed, when she came man. Up. She was ready. She's like, "I'm gonna fucking chuck wood at this." At this. Yeah. Video. I mean, I guess it's that motherly instinct. Like she feels her young are in danger. So, but yeah, like she came ready to fucking fight. And then Brooklyn has like one of his first wooby moments because he all look, looks like hurt and vulnerable after getting hit by the wood. He's just like, oh, but. <laughs> would it, okay, but how would you react to getting hit by wood? I mean, like, honestly, same. I'd be like, actually, I don't. Actually, no, I would start throwing hands. I'd be like, well, I don't know what your deal is, lady. We were just talking to the kid. Like, maybe your problem is that the kid came up to us. Maybe you should watch your own children. How about that? But no, that doesn't happen here. Uh, what does happen is Demona swoops in, uh, literally ready to kill this person. She comes in, she points a finger, she says, you're the beast, you. And then right after that, Brooklyn lets get into it, because Brooklyn says, well, if they think we're beasts and monsters, and then Lexington finishes, then perhaps we'd better live up to the name. I That scene is so um, jarring for me for many reasons. Well, I feel like it's sort of aggro for Lexington to be acting like this. Right, okay, so then they decide to... What they do, they sort of, like, wave their arms in, like, a spooky motion. They're like, ooh, See, that's, we're that's scary why, gargoyles. That's why I was kind of, like, <laughs> caught off guard. I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> I never... I... But, like, it works, though. Just all the humans freak out and run away from them. Then right... Right after that, Goliath and Hudson swing by to break things up. Um, and I feel like we have our second, like, daddy spank moment here. Because Goliath is pissed off. No, yeah. This and is he just like, points this his is finger at the them moment. and says, like, you three, down to the rookery until I return. This is just the moment I'll Goliath... I'll deal with you then. This is just the moment Goliath <laughs> puts on his dad pants. Yeah, he definitely does. Um, and then he, he's also like, and take him with you. Referring to Bronx the dog, which Bronx didn't fucking do anything. Okay, you know something <laughs> else I noticed in this scene though. What? Neither does Broadway. What? Broadway is literally just sitting there He's eating. He's off the to whole the time. side eating. In, I, like guilty by association. Right? I guess. Totally unfair. Um, and then the view like immediately switches to the rookery, 
which is the place where gargoyles get hatched. So it's like the equivalent of like being sent here. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and they look like super dejected as they like you know they slink through the doorway, mm. and like Brooklyn again tries to be like, yeah, we wouldn't have hurt anybody until I was just like go. And then Demona's also right there, and like this is, pisses me off because she was the one who actually did instigate things. She did, but she didn't get any punishment at all. This is it's like, it's like we were talking about that's, earlier. That's the, that's the nepotism. Yeah, it's nepotism. <laughs> she gets to sleep with Goliath, so like she gets to break the rules every once in a while. No, I mean like she um, has she has ownership over him. <laughs> yeah, she owns his dick at least. She does. She does. Um, he says, but she does. She does speak up for the underdog girl. She says, "Like, are you blind? They weren't at fault. The humans were." And Goliath says, "It doesn't matter who was at fault. Like, I can't condone fighting between gargoyles and humans right now. But I'll make it up to them later." See, like, I really, which is like, okay, I really respect like the perspective of Goliath because he's just like, we all need to just get along. But it's like, it's you also respect Demona because it's like getting along is not that simple. You have to stick up for yourself. Yeah, you can definitely understand both points of view here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's um, a social narrative going on in the in just this mm -hmm. first episode. That you know, it's like it's a lot to dissect, but it's definitely there. Like the imp the way the writers implemented it, I think is pretty good. Yeah, I agree. I think they did a really good job, especially for just like just half an hour of animation. But they have to include several battles, um, character dynamics, like introduce like eleven people. Mm -hmm. um, they also did a really good like establishing the themes right away too. Um. So right after this, Goliath and Hudson, they, they finally fly off on their mission to chase the Vikings away. Um, they land and find some like tracks on the edge of the woods, and then they follow them in. They're, like, they're running on all fours, too, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, no, like, I like that. Gargoyle physiology. Um, and as that's happening, we do get several or, or two very brief interludes. We go down to the rookery, where the three dark girls are just like chilling and like being annoyed, and Brooklyn's like, "Oh, sent to the rookery? How embarrassing!" I think Lexington. And then this is probably the part where you got grossed out. Okay, I and think. I remember Lexington <laughs> says, "I haven't been down here since I was hatched," which does right. bring in mind the fact that the gargoyles come from eggs. Like that's true. Yeah, like, and we didn't know that beforehand. So it's not even like being sent to a room; it's like being sent back to your childhood nursery. So, and then the part that grosses me out <laughs> is Broadway straight up takes, like, a, a fucking slime of slime from the wall of, like... Yeah, like, he sniffs it first to make sure it's okay. He does sniff it at first to make sure it's okay, but it's, like, literally just green goo. I don't know what the fuck it is. <laughs> and then he eats it, and then... Lexington off to the side watches it. He's his jaw just oh fucking God. drops. I don't think he was expecting that. Like, I don't even know if that's just normal behavior for gargoyles because, like, I feel like it's normal for Broadway. That's at what least I'm saying. from his characterization established in just this episode. He just eats, I guess. He just that's all he does. And Lexington says something like, I hope we're not down here long. He might eat us. Yeah, I forgot about that. Which oh, is like, man. okay, Lexington, like keep your vorking to yourself, please. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I am I would be amazed if Art of Vet not already exist of Broadway eating him. I'm like oh my God. 95% sure it it does. I'm positive, but I don't. I don't need to see it either. So, um, so right after that, we did our second interlude, and this one is very short. All we see is like uh, an unknown figure, and what I can only describe as red rave lighting, uh, just weakening some bowstrings. Like I guess oh, in yeah. the castle someplace. Mm -hmm. We don't know who this guy there's is. It's some, it's another mysterious figure. Some sabotage at hand. But uh huh. So then we cut back to Goliath and Hudson. Um, they spot a group of Vikings, um, going through the woods, and they swoop down. They have this insane like dual scream noise as they go down, which I really I enjoyed. Do. Yeah, I remember that. It was good. <laughs> 
Um, but they find it's it's not the army. It's just like a skeleton crew leading a large group of like horses, like riderless horses. And that's when that's when Hudson and Goliath realize like it was just a decoy to draw them away from the castle. So they run out of the forest. Um, but the sun is already coming up. It's it's one of Gargoyle's trademark insanely fast sunrises. Um, mm-hmm. They immediately turn to stone after Hudson says something like, we're too late, like in weird slow motion. Yes, yes. There's Which this interesting doesn't shot usually happen. Like, when they're running to the hillside. <laughs> um, like they're on all fours again, running to the hillside. I don't know why they don't just fly. I guess there was no wind at the time. but um, They can't this- fly. They can only glide. Listen, I don't. I'm not a. I'm not a scientist. I don't know how gargoyle wings work. Um, no, there's an interesting shot where it's like we catch like behind them when they're running to the hill as they're on all fours. Oh, um, I did not even notice that. I tried to screenshot it, but I was watching it on Disney Plus through my phone, and it doesn't. Disney Plus does not allow Disney screenshots. Is it is, but it's like the only way I can watch Gargoyles, so I have to compromise. By the way, guys, if you're interested in watching Gargoyles along with us, it's currently available on Disney Plus streaming. We- um, I believe that's the only legal way to acquire it now, other than just buying the DVDs. Honestly, um, but yes, you should probably check it out because it's a good show. Yes, Croup here has the DVDs. I do not. So, well, I- actually, I couldn't find my DVD. Oh, you could. I should say my boyfriend has the DVDs, and he thought they were in one bin, but they weren't. So the the search will continue. Okay. Um, so-, so I and I I I watched watch this on Disney Plus as well. Actually, I see. I see. Okay, it all yes. is coming together now. So as as the sun is up, the Vikings. It turns out their whole army was just like sitting outside the castle, I guess, waiting for this. They all charge an attack. Um, the Scottish defenders do an even worse job this time than last time because this time their bowstrings are all cut and mm-hmm. snap as soon as they draw them back. So like mm-hmm. they can't even shoot arrows at these guys. Yes. Um, and then you see a pair of very manly, like burly arms pulling a winch. And you see just the front gate opening to let the Vikings in. Mm, mm-hmm. I'm I'm starting uh, to think pr- it might be the Magus. Yeah, I mean the Magus has been working out. Yeah, he's underneath that robe, man. He's got he just he does not skip he's, leg day, that's for sure. He's he's got that bara body. <laughs> he's just one of those the, anime characters where it's like they're muscular underneath like normal clothes or whatever. Oh my god. Uh, so we see the princess coming down the stairs yes. and like, like some tower where I guess she lives. And she's all like, <laughs> Captain, Captain, the Vikings, we are attacked. But then he like, the captain sort of grabs like the hem of her dress and is like, oh, it's worse than that. Oh. Your highness. I love that. He says um, in like this acidy tone of voice. Yes, yes. And I noticed this was another scene where like his hair was like just out of control like animation wise it's like every move he makes it like flops around with his emotions <laughs> so and i also need to point out again we do not see the mages for any of this like wh- where the fuck is he? no he we see him like in like shackles with like the princess like they're both that's next episode though for this episode no, he, this we episode. don't see him during the battle we don't that. see him fucking doing anything or was that like a preview for next episode i don't know Oh, there no. was a preview, but I didn't watch that one. No, no, I was no. Like, like, I'll save it. Okay, for next but time. like, there's still some more time where it's like it shows like um, the princess and the Magus and the other people. I guess like getting like they weren't arrested; they were literally just like taken. They they didn't kill them; they just shattered. Do they them. show that? They do. Okay, okay. I thought that was. I thought we first saw that next episode. No, 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 no. You're no. probably right. I probably just and missed then, that part. And then we have the scene. Where Hakon and the guard captain are like on top of like the tower. And... Right. So it it turns out that the guard captain had betrayed <gasps> his people to Hakon, and Hakon is like, well, "Not that I'm ungrateful, but why did you do that?" <laughs> I mean, it's a and valid like... question. <laughs> and yeah, he says, "Why betray your own kind?" And the guard captain replies, "They're not my kind." I mean, which in hindsight, I'm not so. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so in hindsight, with all the uh, tension between 
the guard captain trying to, you know, unite the humans with the gargoyles, but the humans being distasteful towards the gargoyles, and the guard captain's own men mocking him for using the gargoyles, I think tensions mm-hmm. arose from there. And you could see it in his face. Yeah, what... like, he was sick of his of how his own people were treating their gargoyles, exactly. I think. And I, maybe it seems like he, he might consider himself more of a gargoyle than a human? Uh, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, no, um, there was absolutely a correlation between, you know, like, what Demona was trying to instill and him agreeing with it, and the thing is, mm-hmm. um, he took it too far with the betrayal. He thought that, um, giving the Vikings, um, you know, just, like, the the up and up to defeat the Scots to, uh, was was a good solution that way it was like kind of payback for all those um, right resen- all that resentment but it was a very f- stupid way of doing it well yeah like no offense to the dark captain but it just makes no, him seem like a very stupid person he is. because the vikings then immediately turn around and go to smash all the gargoyle statues he tries to, rubble, to stop which Hakon like at first but then Hakon's like... Yeah, like, this like, is what I would expect Vikings to do, but the Dark Captain's very surprised by this, and he's like, no, right? this isn't necessary. But... Like, once you guys just leave the castle, the Gargoyles won't fly after you. Um, because, then, like, he just thinks that the Gargoyles would just, like, let them go and just reclaim the castle, I guess. And then Hakon is legit just like, I have not stayed alive this long by, b- without taking precautions or something like that. And I'm just right. thinking, like, I, I'm I just can thinking, understand that point. If, you're like, like, if I were Hakon, I'd probably kill like the Gargoyles too. So it's like, yeah, uh, they're just gonna, they fucked us up once and they're going to do it again. Right. Um, so yeah, so then the, the Captain of the Guard can only watch like helplessly as Hakon just starts smashing. And it's a very sad, emotional scene. It but is. also, like, Captain, like, what did you think was going to happen? Exactly. Um, yeah, so we we transfer from that into seeing the next night, and Goliath and Hudson are flying back, and they, they find the castle in flames. Uh, everything looks like it's destroyed. Um, like, rubble everywhere. Mm-hmm. And worst of all, they find their gargoyle brethren have all been totally smashed and reduced to rubble and destroyed. Um, including what he thinks, at least, is a pile of Demona's rubble. And he sort of clutches the pieces to himself. He says, my angel of the night. And he just sort of sinks to his knees, like crying out in despair. And that's how the first episode closes. Uh, A big to be continued pops up on the screen. Yes. Yes. Which, just speaking as an eight-year-old boy, that was a pretty good way to make me watch the following episode. Right? Because yeah. that was pretty hardcore. No, yeah. They're, they they don't hold back, is the thing. Yeah, like, the show pretty much lands, like, on, on four feet. Two feet? I don't know. It, it goes very quickly right from the start. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I it, think they knew exactly what they were doing. It doesn't shy away. I mean, like, obviously there's, like, restrictions and stuff. Um, because it's a Disney show, but they don't shy away from showing some of the more darker undertones uh, regarding right. The show. Like you know, this this is it's it's a battle in the Middle Ages, mm-hmm. um, and we we see betrayal, we see uh, discrimination. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like they they definitely don't shy away away from the more mature themes in the show. Yeah, no, uh, I would say like the first episode is like just. It's jam packed with a lot of stuff. We start out in New York. We end in the Middle Ages. We we get this whole like backstory and stuff. Um, right. And I that's- I do recall in the commentary for this episode that Greg Weissman gives, and I, I forget who else was with him, but he does mention that the reason the show starts with that brief scene in New York was so that kids watching wouldn't think the whole show was in Scotland. And that, they might like yeah. not want to watch it. Like it was important to establish right from the start that like it's okay, kids. The show will be in the modern day, but like we're we're showing you an extended flashback first. Absolutely, yeah. No, I I kind of caught Which, on. To I that. I don't know why he was worried about that. When I was a kid, I'd be like, oh fuck yeah, I, I want the whole show to be in nine nine four A.D. Yes, please. So okay, so I guess 
that's the recap. That is uh, the recap. What would you what would you rate this episode? Um like, out of out of how many out of five loincloths would you give this? Five loincloths. Well, there were definitely, you know, we were introduced to the loincloths in this episode, and I think that really we certainly that's were. That's like a huge standing point. Um, I don't really have a lot of complaints. There's a lot of dynamic, a lot to dissect with this first episode, like a lot, and. There's just, you know, there's conflict, there's tension, there's, um, you know... Sexual tension. There is sexual tension with everyone. Like, everyone just wants to fuck Goliath. <laughs> that, and that will continue throughout that, most that of the show. That will continue throughout most of the show. Like, I feel like that's a very high-running theme it for is. many episodes that are coming up. Literally... All of it stems from the radiant sexual tension Goliath gives off. And I think like every time he opens his mouth and mm-hmm. just says anything, like yes. panties get wet. Mm-hmm. Uh, or when he's like just fighting. Uh, whole clench. You yes. know, like all of it. Yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, the other gargoyles are great too. Well, we'll get to everybody. I mean, I don't feel like the trio was given a lot no, to go weren't. over in this episode. Like, if I had one, but they'll thing, definitely all have their moments if, of shine. If I had like one thing I had to nitpick on with this episode, it was like just. I mean, I know I understand it's Broadway's character, but like, I don't know. I, I, I for some reason, I can't collect the memory of just him eating in every single episode, <laughs> like he does in this one, like. I, I I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's all he's gonna do for like this entire five parter is just comedic eating scenes. Oh gosh. Um. I, but yeah, no, that's really the only criticism I have. Um. I think all in all, I would rate the first episode a straight up five five out of five loin claws. Yeah, I mean, I probably would too. Um. The only criticism I really have is I felt like. The Captain of the Guard's character could have used more, uh, like explanation as to like what his mindset was or why he was doing things. I remember point. being very confused as a kid, and I remember being very confused also on this rewatch. Yeah, I was like, I, like I, I was watching with my boyfriend, who's also a big Dark Wars fan, and I had to be like, wait, why is he betraying them? Like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> And he had to explain to me, he was like, he doesn't like that the other Scottish people are racist. And I was like, oh. Pretty much. <laughs> like, I don't like, it's just, I felt like, here I am saying that a children's cartoon show confused me, but like, maybe they just telegraphed that a little bit more. It would have made it more uh, easily digestible. I suppose. I mean, just extend the runtime an extra five minutes, you would have gotten the guard captain's tragic backstory. Yeah, probably. But, yeah, no, all in all, a uh, very, very solid episode. So, um, we should pick out which moment during this episode was definitely where the animators were at their horniest. Right, so we, we are going to have a segment where, for each episode, we'll pick the, the horniest moment that the animators just decided to insert their own kink into. Um, I th- because... Yeah. We're pretty sure that whoever animated the show was just deeply horny all the oh, time. No, yeah. There's just, just judging by the number of things that slip into it animation wise. You you um constantly model around like, you know, such um interestingly designed uh characters, muscle bound men and stuff. There's gonna be some kind of like well, literally you know, bound in many cases. They're bound. They are bound a lot. Yes. I'm amazed they got through an entire episode without putting someone in bondage. Listen, um, Goliath <laughs> injured his hand and he had bandages around his hand majority of the episode. That doesn't count. There was there was rope involved and there was blood. There was like I don't know, but yeah, uh, I think I think we can both agree on what the horniest moment. Um, for the well, I already know yeah, which which we moment is, know. it's going to be mine. So okay, so it's it's Broadway and his belly, right? Yes, absolutely. That's yeah, like it, it can't be anything else. No, no. I mean, like the only things I could think of were um, just Goliath. Any moment where him or Hakon are just interacting or talking, but that's just my own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's just my well, yeah. Own. Like if I had to pick anything else, it would be like any any of Goliath's like needless flexing that he was doing during the fights. Yes, yes, yes. Also great for like no goddamn reason. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I was making direct eye contact with um each one of his pecs at one point, and I was <laughs> like, oh my god, they're looking at me. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, um, horniest moment definitely when Broadway sucks in his gut and he looks super muscular and then his belly just kind of bounces. Uh -huh, and like back to normal Broadway, who is also extremely hot. Like he's hot, super muscular, chubby. Like he's hot. He's hot all the time. Like oh, all of them are. He's goddamn attractive gargoyles. Everybody loves Broadway, and I, you know I love all the freaking main gargoyles. To be quite honest, I mean I know I say like some of them annoy me sometimes. That's just like me. Just mm -hmm. it, it's in the way like you know a little brother would annoy you. It's just like oh okay. <laughs> like well, I think. Between you and I, our, our main point of contention is I don't think I'm actually in the minority in the Dark Oils fandom where I don't think Brooklyn is very attractive. Yeah, which I'm most kind people of there. like rip me a new asshole for even saying that out loud. The, no, like I, the, I kind the, of the get it. Though. Depth of his fandom. Well, whereas you do think that Brooklyn is like hot. I do. Um, but not because I mean, like he is hot, but well, I just don't think it's like. I, I don't think he's hotter than some of the other characters in this show, but I think yeah, like he's not as hot as Lexington, for instance, who was like super hot to me. Oh, Lexington is just he's he's fucking great. But so all right, so that that was our horniest moment. I'm glad we we agreed on our first one. Yes, yes, we we're are. of one mind on this. We who are. in this episode would you say was the gayest character or exhibited the most? Gayness. <laughs> um, part of me is leaning towards the guard captain. Uh huh. Um, another part of me is leaning towards Haken, but that's just because of my own biases. <laughs> uh no, I mean, I actually agree with you. I think that um, there was a moment during the last scene. Or one of the last scenes where like Hakon threw the guard captain like up against the wall. There is. And then like leaned in. And I was literally expecting them to kiss. Like right mm. there. Am I alone in that? No, you're not. You're not. Like I kind of saw that too. Like okay. <laughs> like, you know, Hakon was threatening him, but he didn't have to threaten him so, you know, so intimately. Yeah, like, he, like, leaned in real close and had, like, an evil, like, whisper thing going with his deep, yes. gravelly voice. Yes. I think... I, I don't know, like, I, I was I was seeing things there. I was seeing things. And, I was also seeing things whenever, like, whenever he was, like, looking at, like, Goliath, or, um, like, when he first <laughs> saw him, when he first saw that statue, there was a part of me in the back of my oh brain my that God. was just like, yeah, no, he wants to fuck that statue. See, are you sure this isn't just, like, your residual feelings for Wolf bleeding into his distant ancestor? No, it absolutely 100% is that. I believe that everybody in Wolf's lineage is built up of is, repressed, is gay for Goliath? repressed homosexual <laughs> men who use their toxic masculinity to take it out on, uh, on the gargoyles. They're like, oh, I'm so attracted I mean, I to you, I hate it. I can't disagree with this. It'll be fun when we finally get to Wolf's first episode and get to really talk about him. Oh god, I'm gonna go nuts. <laughs> I'm gonna go nuts. I can already feel it. Um, I love the pack, and that will be enjoyable for both of us. That will be very enjoyable, yes. Um, so... So, Hakon, gayest character in the episode? Maybe. Uh, guard yeah, I would I would say Dark Captain and Hakon together yeah, are the gayest no, character. Because uh, Dark Captain, he even like left the castle for like you know like a um a hookup, a secret hookup with Hakon. yeah. Before like before the betrayal happened. And let's like, not... you know you know he took off that mysterious hooded cloak at okay. some point in Hakon's tent, and he also took off everything else no, while he was um, at it. The guard captain and was they, completely uh... naked under the cloak. Oh my, yeah, he's just like a flasher. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they have ways to seal their agreements, these medieval, yes, yes. medieval men. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, like, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, you're saying the guard captain needs more embellishment on his motivation. We can fill in the blanks right there. He wanted to fuck Goliath. Love made him do it. He, it was all <laughs> in, a, in the name of love. His love for beefy gargoyles. See, it's funny, just like, that's also Demona's motivation, which we'll get into more 
in further episodes. Well, it's a part of why the guard captain Demona generally agreed against against you know the whole. They thing. seem like besties. They did. Seem I like wish besties. we got. We actually, I actually wish we got more characterization for guard captain in like the more flashback episodes that we get. But like, I don't think like it even just, shows up in any of them. There's just like a scene where like Goliath is unaware his dick is sticking out of his glowing cloth and he looks at Demona oh and the guard captain. He's like, "What are you looking at?" And Demona <laughs> and the guard captain just kind of fist bump. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I can see it, and and now I ship it. And yeah, no, absolutely. That's just the dynamic I saw. So yeah, no. All in all, um, I would say it's a tie between Hakon and the guard captain for the uh the 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 gayest the gay the gay form. well i mean they're, they're gay they're, they're, they're gayer, gayer together, together they are. than they are apart so i think they should share the thought for this episode they should yeah yes i mean for, you know we haven't really gotten into like the real homoeroticism that is brewing no, no this is why just we under the surface of the show like this episode is pretty like heteronormative to start with it's mostly like Goliath and demona I'm, being lovey i'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the rake Bill... if you keep going on about this <laughs> four loincloths not gay enough not gay. yeah that's true yeah there's, it's, there has to be at least a requisite number of gayness in it Yes. To uh, achieve that COVID five line cloth rating. That is true. Yeah. I mean, like story wise, it's brilliant, but it just needs it just needs more uh, more rainbow splotches around the base of the frame. Yeah. It just needs the captain of the dark to like squeeze Goliath's pecs like while he's a statue and dream of squeezing them at nighttime as well. Because you know that happened. No, that did. I'm, 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 you know that's the real reason I'm the soldiers make fun right of him because he's a he's just a gargoyle fancier. They like that part where the guard captain says they are not my kind when he's talking about the scots. He's really just he really just wants to become a gargoyle. That's his whole thing. He wants to wear a loincloth like Goliath does, and like follow behind him and watch as the loincloth sort of like flips up in the wind every once in a while. He's like. He's like um a more aggressive variant of like those characters in media where they're just like they're more in tune with like animals. It's like him with like bara like gargoyles and stuff. Like they just speak to him like nothing else. Does. Oh, it's like he's like uh like it's a spirit animal. Yes. Or something like what's that. the word know, for those like people? Like like uh hippies. Oh my gosh, there's an actual word for them. I'll think of it later. Hippies. I'll think of it after this podcast is over, and we won't they're, edit it in. They're, they're nature hippies. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know if we have much else to say about this one. I feel like this episode of this podcast is already going to be very long, so I'm perhaps we do should some, do our I'm obviously here. going to do some editing, but yeah, no, it's going to be a biggie, and that's because it's the first episode. I feel like all the Awakening ones will probably be close to but not the same length as this first episode but yeah probably yeah, the next one is going to be a lot too because a bunch of more characters will also come be introduced oh god i'm i can't i can't wait i'm all i know one in particular i'm especially looking forward to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah but so i guess uh where can we find you sid on the internet uh i don't don't find me anywhere i'm like i'm like <laughs> uh i uh, know um like i i want to you know shout out my twitter but it's very not safe for work um i think i don't think this podcast is safe for work either no it's not um my twitter is sid scripts but i mostly just retweet porn um and i also do online writing i do online writing commissions and editing commissions uh i mean honestly people you could come to me with like almost any idea I'd be like hey uh you think you can uh i don't know maybe write some sort of weird fan fiction where like um like jack and the beanstalk where broadway eats lexington broadway eats and lexington bores him and bores him and i'll be like yeah i can write that i would legit <laughs> write that if someone came to me for that I should ask you to do a Captain of the Guard and Hakon. Like, yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, Twitter handle is at Sid Scripps. That is S Y D S C R I P T S. 
and you can find me i'm on twitter as well uh under the manly unicorn uh no spaces it's just all one word and i'm also on fur affinity under croup uh most of my writing goes up there um i also have um some books on amazon under the mm. name sg croup they're very good um if you if you just find my twitter name actually i have a um I have a pinned post that has like links to most other places mm -hmm. I'm at. So that, that's probably the easiest place to find me. Yes. But uh, yeah. Thank you all for listening to this first episode. And please subscribe to wherever you're listening to this from, presumably SoundCloud. Yeah. Um, unless we put it other places as well. I can't think of how to end this. <laughs> it's already over, baby.